Hi, I'm Sam Fesich from the EduMagic Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Coming up on episode 141 of the House of EdTech podcast, we're going to be talking about our health. A great app has gone free for educators. I have a different spin on the House of EdTech VIP, and today I'm talking about engaging your audience with Catchbox. Strike up the band. Welcome to the House of EdTech podcast. I am your host, Chris Nessie. The House of EdTech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. I discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools, and I share tools and tips that you can hear today and use tomorrow. You're going to hear the stories of teachers, leaders, and creators just like you. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way you teach and how your students learn. Welcome back to the House of EdTech podcast. Thank you for making this show a part of your anytime, anywhere professional development. If this is your first time, well, the the bad news is you have 140 episodes to catch up on. But the good news is you are here now. And thank you for coming back, my longtime listener. So great to have you here. All right, let's start off with a little bit of feedback and helping somebody out. I got an email from Sean Harms, and his email says, Hello, which is a great way to start an email. (laughs) Hello, first year history teacher here trying to use Google Classroom for a research project. I have an outline that I want the students to fill in, but I cannot figure out how to allow them to only fill in and not edit the template that I have created. I'm worried about a few of my students who may just delete or change the words in the template. Is there a way to create a fill inable template? that they could fill in, but not change. I really love listening to the podcast and I would love any help you can give. Well, Sean, a great solution to that is a feature that is already built right into Google Classroom. When you create an assignment in Google Classroom or you post a material, you have the ability when you attach something from Google Drive, and I'm going to say that you made this template that you're talking about in Google Drive, so it's a Google Doc. When you attach it to the assignment, you have the option, well, there's a couple options. One is let students view the file, uh, let students edit the file, and the important one here is make a copy for each student. That's the option that you want to select anytime you create something that you would basically be replacing the fact that like you went to the copy machine and you made copies of something physical for each student. This gives students a blank version, their own version of whatever you want them to type in or type on. And this is something that I really like to take advantage of when I do DBQs, which I just started. And now we're talking social studies here, you know, Sean and I, (laughs) Um, but DBQs are document based questions. And I basically prepackage the documents and the student analysis questions, and even them doing their outlines and preparing to write their essay in a Google doc that I then distribute through Google classroom And I make a copy for each student by selecting that option. So every student in the class gets their own version of the document. And it's great because then their student ID number or their name, however your school does it, will be a part of the file name. So you'll know how it's associated with the students. So you don't have to waste space on these documents with them, you know, doing their heading and writing your name and the date and all that stuff that we did when we were kids. So take advantage of the make a copy for each student option in Google Classroom. And I hope that helps. Also, I'd like to announce that I am the new producer of the Burned In Teacher podcast hosted by Amber Harper. She is already a member of the Education Podcast Network, and you should be listening to her podcast if you're not already. It was great before I got my hands on it, and it's going to continue to be a great podcast, not because of me, but because of the tremendous amount of work that Amber puts into her podcast. Let me pull back the curtain a little bit on the Burned In Teacher podcast. 
I was already a listener because that's how it got on the network. I find value in the podcast and that's how I bring podcasts onto the education podcast network. But when I got to talking with Amber in the last couple of weeks about becoming her producer and editing her episodes and preparing her show notes and, you know, getting involved in her website and a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that make her podcast go, I was so impressed by the types of documents she has for planning and organizing and preparing to put together each episode of the burned in teacher podcast. So if you're not listening, head out when you're done with this one, when you're done with this episode of the house of ed tech, go over to burned in teacher.com and subscribe you. I promise you will not regret it. And not because I'm involved in the show. Now Amber is doing great work and her podcast deserves you listening to it. And you deserve her podcast in your life. She's got great content over there. Also a quick reminder that I am accepting submissions for the 2019 House of EdTech Smackdown. If you're new to the program, this will be the sixth annual Smackdown, and this is my last episode each calendar year. So we're talking about 2019 here. So I'm asking you to share with me your EdTech recommendations, tips, whatever you're loving in education technology right now this year in 2019. I want to hear about it. Send that to me by December 1st, 2019, and you can choose the best way for you by visiting chrisnessy.com slash feedback. But please keep in mind, this is an audio podcast. So if you send me audio, I will be really happy when I put that episode together. Or I just have to read your email in my best impression of you voice. And if I've never heard your voice, well, you take your chances with how I'm going to impersonate you. So if you want it to be accurate, send me audio. Let's tackle the ed tech thought. I basically want to share with you the fact that I'm in a good place right now. Now, I know my voice might sound a little scratchy, and if it hasn't, well, the jig is up and I spoiled the fact that I've been under the weather for a couple of weeks, fighting something that's upper respiratory and, you know, behind my nose, so to speak. Um, But anyway, other than me being a little sick and under the weather, I've really been in a good place. Now, I haven't spoken about it on the podcast at great length. I believe it came up a little bit a few episodes ago when I had my wife Caitlin on the show, but back in August, I took major steps towards my personal health and my well-being. Caitlin got me to join CrossFit. During August, I was doing something called CrossFit Sweat, which is really more cardio, cardio? Yeah, I'm just going to make up words. Really more cardio and, you know, running and doing a lot of exercises based on your body weight and stuff like that. And... You know, I was going three days a week and sweating profusely. You know, after the first day, I threw up outside the the place that we go to. We mentioned it. It's uh, called CrossFit Speakeasy in Belmar, New Jersey. And the second day I went there, I felt that I had to throw up, but I didn't. And I haven't had that feeling since. Uh, as I'm recording this episode, I have lost 10 pounds since August 1st. And once the school year started and my whole schedule changed with Rutgers and going to school and basically going back to work and not being a teacher on summer vacation, uh, I changed it up and I am now doing actual CrossFit. And I'm not going to lie, I get my butt kicked three nights a week and I love it. I'm not here to tell you to go out and do CrossFit. I'm sharing this with you because I want you to also make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Your physical and mental well-being is what makes you do all the awesome things that you're doing personally, professionally, with your family, your friends, with your students, with your colleagues. That's important. For me, taking control of my physical health has been something that I've been struggling with for, I'll say, 20 years because I've been out of high school 20 years. And while I may never be 189 pounds ever again, I could certainly stand to lose some weight and put a little more a little more pep in my step. Now, here on the podcast, I always present a happy version of myself, even in some of my ed tech thoughts where, honestly, I've complained about, you know, not having the type of job that I believe that I would be good for. But that's neither here nor there. We both know that happy all the time is tough to maintain. But I'll be honest, it is not hard to sound happy talking about ed tech with you. 
So I just wanted to take a moment here in this episode just to encourage you and just remind you to take time for your health and your well-being in a way that brings you joy. For me, I have, I won't say fall in love, but I'm enjoying exercise and doing the CrossFit. I am. If you follow me on Instagram, you know, I, I do share stories before, you know, I, I work out each time. And if I remember or if I'm actually up to it, I'll share after the fact. And, you know, if you've ever seen the really nice picture of me, I don't look like that after I'm done working out. I'm kind of a mess. So if you want to share your story with me about what you do to escape education and technology and what you do to take care of you, I would love to hear it. Share it with me there. There, you know, you know, the ways to get in touch with me again, if this is your first time listening, Hey, head over to Chris slash feedback and let me know what you do. And I would love to get to know you and you might teach me something more than education and technology. And, you know, we can go on that journey together. Let's do the EdTech recommendation. And for this episode, I'd like to recommend an app called Notion, N-O-T-I-O-N. You can find it at notion.so. And the specific URL that I'd like you to remember is notion.so slash educators. Notion recently became free for teachers and students. Now, I know that most likely you are a K-12 educator. I don't get a lot of college higher ed people listening to the show, but that's neither here nor there. But the important thing is it's free for people with a college email. So for college students and obviously college employees. So if you're a K-12 educator, maybe taking a master's program or going for your doctorate or anything like that, or if you still have access to your college email, take advantage because if you go to notion.so, you can get the notion app for free. So they have a web app, a desktop app, and a mobile app, of course. I mean, it's 2019. If you don't have those things, well, then you probably don't exist as a piece of technology. But what this app does, and I'm looking at their site right now, so I am on notion.so slash educators. So it is marketed as one workspace, as they say, for your syllabi, your notes, assignments, grades, and more. But it's a really clean minimalistic planning tool where you can have digital syllabi. So again, if you're a K-12 teacher, you could put in course outlines, or if you do a syllabus or a schedule of uh, assignments or events happening in a marking period, let's say, you can certainly use this. Uh, you get a simple web page for your classroom. You can do lesson planning within this app. You can add things to your course schedule. You can build a class directory of the people in your classes um, so it, it, it's kind of like Google classroom, but not in the Google sphere. Um, but I, I think this is, this would be really cool to look at. And obviously there's a student side, which encourages students. And even, even you, if you go to professional development or you're into, you know, how you take notes, you can post class notes to things. You can have students doing digital Cornell notes through this app. Uh, again, you'd have to have people with a, with a college email. So again, if you're working in a K-12 school, you know, this might not be the app that you introduce to your students, but certainly if you've got access to it, I, I think this could be valuable. I mean, you can do, you can do budgeting in here. You can do lesson plans. Um, there, there's just, I, I think it's worth it. If you ran a club, you might be able to post stuff and have kids even in K-12 be able to see information about a club. You can set goals, you can journal, um, if you go over to notion.so slash educators, they do have um, a live demo that you can play with via the website. And then again, if you've got the college email, I think this might be cool to check out. Um, Notion is a good tool for a school uh, and it couldn't hurt to do more with your maybe your class mission and things like that. Um, and again, you're eligible for this free access if you are a student or an educator uh, at an accredited college or university. So you've got that dot edu email address, uh, but there'll be a link in the show notes to this. Check this app out. I'm going to play with it on my phone. I'm going to play with it on my desktop and you know, I'll, I'll report back that that seems to be 
uh, a role that I want to fill is to try things and share them with you. And, you know, if you, if you try it first and you've got an opinion, you know, go over to chrisnessy.com slash feedback and, you know, share your thoughts. And, or if you're already using this, I would love to hear about, you know, your experience and I will share more about this as I play with it in the future. So that's the EdTech recommendation. All right, time for the featured content of this episode. And as the title suggests, we are talking about engaging your audience. And I want to talk about a piece of technology called Catchbox. So this is a review of Catchbox. Catchbox reached out to me back in August about becoming a sponsor of this very podcast. And I told them first and foremost that before I could consider adding a sponsor to the podcast, that I would have to have the opportunity to use any product or service that they're, they are selling or talking about. So they agreed. But what is Catchbox? As they market it, their tagline is, it's the world's first soft, throwable microphone. That's right. We are talking about a microphone that you can throw. I know it sounds crazy, but I got to try it for a month. So here we go. Uh, let me be clear. This is not a paid promotion. I have not been paid by Catchbox for anything. And what I'm about to share is my complete, honest review and feedback. And I'm going to be telling you some information from the Catchbox website. And I'm also going to share what Catchbox, the actual device, how it kind of fit into my classroom over this first month here of the school year in September 2019. So everything I'm about to share is my honest, uncompensated opinion. Okay. Catchbox immediately agreed and they sent me one of their devices to use for the last month. And I've had Catchbox set up in my classroom since the first day of school, and I worked it into the climate and culture of my classroom here in the first month of the school year. Catchbox markets their product as something that will allow you to engage your audience with a throwable wireless microphone. Whether you want to increase engagement for conference attendees, activate the students in a room, or make meetings more fun, Catchbox believes that they can help. Okay? There are three versions of Catchbox. They're called Catchbox Module, Catchbox Lite, and Catchbox Plus. Catchbox Module has a starting MSRP of $399. Catchbox Lite has a MSRP of $549. And Catchbox, Catchbox Plus starts at $649. Okay. So what's the difference between these three versions? So these are some of the tech specs according to their website, which you can find at us.catchbox.com. Okay. So the Catchbox module, that is just this plush cube with the microphone. That's it. There's no built-in transmitter. There's no built-in receiver, but they do have the built-in technology that would allow you to pair the microphone with a third-party transmitter and receiver, and they have a whole list of compatible transmitters and receivers that you could potentially connect this device to. So just the microphone by itself is $399. The microphone just by itself, again, these are, you know, for audiences up to like 2,000 people, okay? Now, I used it in a classroom at most that had, throughout this, the first month, you know, 26, I think at one point my largest class had 27 students in it. So what is this? So it's the built-in microphone. It's got active auto-mute technology, which just means that if the device isn't being tossed or dropped, it kind of auto-mutes itself so you don't get feedback or strange noise in a room that could be certainly equipped with a sound system. Uh, they say it is dirt repellent. I would have to agree because mine still looks very clean and they sent me a white one. <laughs> uh, it does have interchangeable covers. 
You can also, at, on any of these, you can pay extra and you could customize it. So you could put on a school logo, um, a- any type of graphic. They can screen print that on there. Um, the Plus, Catchbox Plus, has wireless charging. And I, uh, right here as I'm talking about this, uh, I don't know if I already said it, but they sent me Catchbox Plus. So they sent me to try their top-of-the-line full-featured model that has a wireless base station for charging, and it also comes with the built-in transmitter, and it comes with a receiver that I was able to simply connect to the sound system in my classroom. So I just had to connect the cables. They sent me, I told them what the setup of my classroom was, and they sent me everything I would need to connect the receiver, and then I charged the device powered it up and I had a wireless microphone in my classroom. Um, the battery type, as I'm looking here, the battery type on the microphone, it, it has a, a built in battery and the signal type is digital and it's very light. The, the it doesn't matter which model you get. Um, it, it's it's light. I think it's at most nine and a half ounces and only the plus one is wireless charger compatible. And the dimensions, it's basically an 18 by 18 by 18 centimeter cube or seven by seven by seven. Okay. And let, let's get, to, I mean, that, that's, ba- I mean, I, I'll link to the different, tech specs, but everything I just shared, that's the basics. It's a seven by seven by seven cube. It's soft. It's squishy with the core microphone and, you know, you can toss it around. You can toss it around the classroom. You can toss it around your school. Basically, that's what it's built for. So it's not like passing a wireless mic or a wired microphone that it could, you know, would be considered delicate or anything like that. So here are my thoughts on Catchbox. First and foremost, very cool. And I think Catchbox is unique. But I'll be honest, I am not 100% sold on it being the right technology for a K-12 classroom. In my classroom, I have ninth grade students. And they, each group, I have six classes, each group initially thought it was cool. Honestly, them thinking it was cool ended after about five minutes. And that was with me putting in planning here in the first month to design opportunities for them to, to speak. It might be the size of my classroom, but it, it, it didn't, we can all hear each other. So without it, and now I'm not going to have it for the rest of the school year. Um, they, my students have no problem hearing me in the classroom. And, you know, I encourage them to speak louder when they are speaking. And a lot of what we do winds up being group work anyway. So even when they're presenting, this is not something they would stand in the front of the classroom with and speak into like a traditional microphone. They did enjoy throwing it around and I let them put it through its paces, you know, so it definitely held up. The microphone didn't, you know, pop out of the cube or anything. So it's definitely durable, but I really think that the value of this would certainly be felt in a large group setting, not a classroom full of 26 people and maybe not at the high school level. Could this be valuable in elementary school? Sure. It's plush and kids can throw it around. They, they can be rough with it. And again, it, it amplifies student voice. Like literally it amplifies student voice. Okay. Now I could see a school having one of these and using it say during a faculty meeting or maybe even in, in a district, maybe the board of education uses it when you know your board of ed meeting opens up for public comments instead of having people come up to a podium you could toss this thing around and that might be pretty cool and adults might enjoy doing that now if you teach at the college level and you teach in a lecture hall that has 50 75 100 students this would be a great option to amplify student voice in that setting i could also see catchbox being used at a conference say during a smackdown or having any type of large group that needs a microphone, you would probably get value 
from a catch box. Did the technology work as advertised? Absolutely. Everything the literature says this device would do, it did. And I felt responsible and uh, the need to make sure that I tested it. You know, that, that's why I'm talking about it here. Okay. Would I love to keep it in my school? Absolutely. It, 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 is, it is cool. It would add value. Um, I don't know if it's right for my class, my students, the way I run my class. Uh, I, I guess if you want students to be engaged and really be participating, this might be something worth considering. But as I record this, it is all packed up and it will be sent back to the nice, nice folks at CastBox. If you have more questions about CatchBox, then feel free to send them my way. I will have links to their resources, their website, and their frequently asked questions, and that'll all be out at chrisnessy.com slash 141. If you have also used CatchBox, then hey, reach out. Let, let, let me hear your experience with it. I, I would love to certainly share your story here on the podcast. And again, I just want to finish by saying they did not pay me. They reached out to me and I, I'll be honest. I don't think I would see bringing them on as a sponsor of this show. Not because I don't believe in the product. One, I don't want to add a sponsor at least right now. And two, I just don't think that their technology is right for the average K-12 classroom. So that's my thoughts on Cashbox. Before I get to the House of EdTech VIP, I just want to make known that there is a segment that I haven't done in a few episodes called Just Give It a Try. Every episode ends with me saying, using technology isn't difficult, just give it a try. And this past summer, I added a new segment to the podcast called Just Give It a Try, where you share your stories about things you have tried in your school, your classroom, whether it worked, whether it didn't work. I want to share your story, and this is the place in the episode where I'm not formally interviewing you. I want to get your voice here on the podcast. So go out to chrisnessy.com slash Flipgrid and select the Just Give It a Try grid and share your story about something you tried in your classroom, and I'd love to share it here on a future episode of the podcast. And now the House of Ed Tech VIP, which, as I said... I got a little bit of a different spin. So this is the House of Ed Tech, very important, not person. I want to sneak in a little information about a podcast that I think is valuable and important, and I think you should give it a listen. This is the 1619 podcast from the New York Times. In August of 1619, a ship appeared on this horizon near Point Comfort a coastal port in English colony of Virginia. It carried more than 20 enslaved Africans who were sold to the colonists. No aspect of the country that would be formed here has been untouched by the years of slavery that followed. It's 2019. This is the 400th anniversary of this fateful moment in our history. And this podcast is here to tell the story truthfully. The 1619 Project is a major initiative from the New York Times, and it's observing, again, the 400th anniversary of the beginning of American slavery. It aims to reframe the country's history, understanding 1619 as our true founding, and placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are. The podcast is hosted by Nicole Hannah-Jones, and she is a domestic correspondent for the New York Times Magazine, focusing on racial injustice. She has written on federal failures to enforce the Fair Housing Act, the resegregation of American schools and policing in America, her extensive reporting in both print and radio on the ways segregation in housing and schools is maintained through official action and policy, has earned the National Magazine Award, a Peabody, and a Polk Award. Ms. Hannah-Jones earned her bachelor's in history and African-American studies from the University of Notre Dame, 
and her master's is in journalism and mass communication from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Miss Hannah Jones lives in Brooklyn with her husband and her very sassy daughter. And this is all courtesy of the website for 1619. And there'll be a link out in the show notes at chrisnessy.com slash 141. Whether you teach history or not, I've listened to the first three episodes of this podcast, and it is, of course, well-produced. I mean, it's the New York Times, okay? It better be well-produced, and it'll certainly give you a different perspective on the impact that Africans and African-Americans have had in this country since 1619, and I think that that's very important, which also demonstrates, hey, I actually also do care about history. So if you ever doubted that, here's me talking about history on the House of EdTech podcast. Thanks for checking out episode 141 of the House of EdTech podcast. Thank you again to Catchbox for sending me a unit to play with for the last month. And again, if you think the Catchbox would be valuable in your classroom, head out to the website and check it out and see if that would be something that you can pull off for your classroom or to get your school to purchase. And if you need my opinion, well, hit rewind. (laughs) Uh, Feel free to keep the conversation going. I would love to connect with you and hear about your thoughts on what I shared. Uh, If you have thoughts on Catchbox, please send them my way. For this episode, you can go out to chrisnessy.com slash 141, or you can send me a message by going to chrisnessy.com slash feedback. Now, the other way that you can kind of get involved with the House of EdTech community, and I haven't mentioned this in a while, I do have a Facebook group for the podcast. You can go out to chrisnessy.com slash Facebook, and I only talk about that link here on the podcast. So if you go out to chrisnessy.com, you don't see any mention of it. So you're getting it straight from me. So there's a Facebook group. We have a budding, growing community of approximately 280, 290 educators And we talk about things I talk about here on the show. I I live stream into there. I'm also thinking about doing some uh, office hours where going in and live streaming and having you come on and chat with me and kind of do it live. So if that's something that's interesting to you and you want to be a part of the community, go out to chrisnessy.com slash Facebook. And if you enjoy the House of Ed Tech, when you're done with this episode, go tell somebody else about the show. Take them by the hand, take their phone if they don't listen to podcasts, and subscribe them if they're interested in education and technology. You're getting value from this podcast. Help other people get value too. (laughs) Um, The other way that you can support the podcast is by becoming an awesome supporter. My awesome supporter program is powered by Patreon.com, and Patreon allows a consumer of content like you to support a creator of content like me. Many thanks to all of my awesome supporters, and they include Anthony Arnault of the New Teacher Podcast out at newteacher.org, Eric Kurtz of Control Alt Achieve the Podcast, Dan Gallagher from gallagertech.edublogs.org, Carlos Garza, Peggy George, Jen Giffen, Jeff Herb, Mike Messner, JP Prezavento, Scott Titmus, and Kyle Wilcox. You go out to the website, you can see how to get in touch with all of them. The next episode comes out on October 13th. Until next time, thanks for learning with me. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. (laughs) 